Well, thank you, Barney, and uh, thank you all. It's, uh, I wish I could say this was a more positive topic. It's, 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 it's a grim topic uh, that we uh, face this morning, but it's an important topic, and we, we need to understand it correctly if we do uh, make the most appropriate responses. Um, I'll try and keep this to the 20 minutes we've got, so we have time afterwards for the discussion after that uh, presentation. And uh, some of you may have seen some of these slides before it became a longer version of this. Um, the longer version is available of what it's worth on um, uh, ABC Big Ideas, just in case you're looking at these slides. So uh, we're dealing with a group that has a vision of itself as a color fate. It, this is a New York Times graphic from June 13, uh, June um, uh, 13 this year, um, at which point it seems rather farcical that this group controls so much territory. It doesn't control all that territory down to Damascus and Syria, but it does control um, much of the rest, of course, I, it's unlikely it's going to get Baghdad, but it's, it's all around the suburbs of Baghdad at the moment. It controls effectively the territory of the two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris north of Baghdad. And that territory is a territory the size of Great Britain. Uh, it's much more arid than Great Britain, so it's a tenth of the population, but it's still eight million people. Um, now, they boast that 100,000 people have sworn allegiance to them, but that really means eight million people who are hostage to them. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the sectarian and <coughs> ethnic dimension, and, and there's no question that this group has expanded into uh, the north of Iraq, the north of Syria, where uh, there's a, a very disaffected Sunni population, um, but they're hardly welcoming them. The group that we're talking about <coughs> is really a continuation of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and of course that was formed in, in um, 2004. I have an earlier group that Musab al zakawi and Standa formed in 2003. And this really comes all out of the perfect storm positions of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. So we can run history again. One good thing not to do uh, the same way it would be to invade Iraq, particularly the way it was done, um, but it is what it is. But we are, we are reaping that harvest still. Um, we were caught by surprise with the fall of Mosul, June 10, but actually there were lots of indications this was coming. Time magazine uh, back in December uh, published cover story with the face of, uh, of a man who calls himself Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. That non is, is significant because he is a, a native of Baghdad and therefore claims some legitimacy within Iraq. Um, and he, of course, is he's proven to be quite a masterful leader of uh, what we now know as Islamic State. He took over uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, Islamic State in Iraq in 2010, seized the opportunity afforded by the civil war in Syria. Um, he held a... a, a, a um, an earlier history, like uh, Zakawi, um, he is uh, more given to uh, ruthless approaches than, um, than perhaps others in Al-Qaeda um, and has had a troubled relationship with Al-Qaeda court. He formed Jabhat al-Nusra as well as forming um, uh, uh, or, or taking over the leadership of the Islamic State in Iraq. Um, we've had acknowledgement from President Obama that this is actually a worse situation than we thought. Uh, we had underestimated, or at least his office had underestimated the scale of the problem. I think we all recognize now it's a very significant scale. Um, Zakawi, who is the, the, the genius behind this uh, movement, caught him that honor, um, had a long history of involvement on Qaeda back in the, in the 80s and the early 90s, formed a training camp where he was successful in drawing a lot of foreign fighters. And that's been a, a significant pattern of this current movement. Um, Zakawi, of course, um, has a history of, of uh, long involvement, um, both with Al-Qaeda, but as a, as a native of Jordan, um, got his revenge on the government in Jordan in 2005, with the attacks on Amman, Jordan. Uh, there's been a decade of attacks. Uh, they've intensified the last couple of years, but they, they come out of a long base, so it's about, not come out of nowhere. Um, the Prime Minister has referred to this group as, as not being Islamic, and I think that's a fair argument, and as not being a state. I can understand why he says it, but of course, it uses the language of Islam, regrettably, uh, and, and, and targets Muslim families in its recruitment. Uh, and it has got a functioning state, not one we want to recognize, but it's well governed, uh, it's well managed. Um, it's come out of a, of a, of a regime, uh, of, a, of a region in crisis, and, and that's, of course, the nature of this modern Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorist threat. Uh, Al-Qaeda, despite what it would claim, has a difficult message to sell. It's not a popular message. Uh, it struggles to sell its message. It's most effective, and it's devastatingly effective at the moment, in its affiliate movements, where there's uh, state failure. And there's, of course, state failure on a dramatic scale in Syria and Iraq, um, but in Libya, uh, 
uh, in, uh, to a lesser extent in, in e Egypt, uh, has its own problems, and of course across uh, the rest of North Africa and the Horn of Africa. And so um, a recent report on, on terrorism published by the Institute for Economics and Peace said that 82% of terrorist attacks in the last decade have occurred in five countries. You can guess them, Iraq, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Somalia, all cases of, of political failure. So here we have a situation with large numbers of IDPs and refugees, uh, half of uh, the population of Syria living out of their homes, three and a half million living uh, outside Syria as refugees, another um, six, eight million internally displaced people. Lesser numbers in Iraq, but, but serious problems across the north of Iraq. Uh, the new element we're dealing with is this large number of foreign fighters. And this map actually, even though it's only a month old, is, is already out of date. Because we know that Indonesia has come awoken to the fact that there's 300 uh, Indonesians gone to fight already, and a number that's rising very sharply. Um, and uh, of course, in Australia, we, we speak of 70 in the field, but the actual numbers are not certain, and, and we've had uh, some dozens come and go back, uh, come, uh, come back, um, and it's not been possible to, to uh, lay charges against them. And the support community here uh, goes into the hundreds. So it's a, even our problem is smaller than, say, Tunisia, which has 3,000 foreign fighters gone to the region. Most of these fighters have come from North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, three quarters, but 4,000 or so from uh, the UK, from Europe, from North America, from Australia. Um, this group is occupying territory along, uh, as I said, along the two rivers. Uh, AQI, as we call it, often called itself Al-Qaeda in the land of the two rivers. Um, a very evocative name, but they've made good on that long-term vision they've had. So they occupy most of the northern reaches of the Euphrates and the Tigris. Um, and of course, ethnically, the, the pattern is very significant. It's, it's, these are Sunni majority areas, um, and uh, there's a lot of grievance to work with but as I said a minute ago, 8 million people under their control and, and the vast majority not welcoming them. Uh, but what would you do if your town was occupied by Islamic State? You'd keep your head down, try and stay out of trouble. Um, so they found an inroad because of sectarian uh, conflict and state failure. It doesn't mean that they're popular. Uh, it, it, uh, they may have a certain degree of conversion amongst a local youth, but, but really um, uh, it's a police state ruling by fear. Uh, but they're not likely to expand outside, uh, at least within Iraq, Syria itself, outside the Sunni majority areas, uh, despite claims they might make. That still gives them considerable territory. Uh, they run up against the Kurds in the northeast of Iraq and uh, the northeast of Syria. Um, whether or not the, the effective Kurdish capital uh, of Erbil would have fallen were it not for airstrikes, it's not clear, but it's certainly a, a likely scenario. So, um, although uh, they would have trouble taking the, the Kurdish northeast. They could certainly have done a lot of damage crossing the frontier. Uh, they've been held in bay now at the moment, as in Syria. But of course, we, we know the story with um, Kobane, which is now just a little isolated peninsula jutting out from Turkey, uh, from, from Kurdish Turkey into Syria, and is still um, very much hanging in the balance. We began to pay attention to this movement June 10. June 10 was when Mosul fell, second largest city in Iraq, uh, and within the space of four days, uh, this group had moved all the way down the Tigris uh, uh, towards Baghdad. Um, it had already moved along uh, the Euphrates in Umbar province, uh, but it was the fall of Moses that really scared us. They took Mosul, they took Mosul, some days later they took Mosul Dam, the largest uh, dam you see on the top left hand corner there uh, in Iraq. Um, that was taken back through airstrikes, but, but still, um, this was a, uh, a very frightening advance. They are very effective in their messaging, and, and part of the reason they're so effective in getting foreign fighters is uh, not the message of jihad and violence, which we hear. They, they project that message to us to make us angry, because when we get angry, it makes recruiting easier. Uh, but the message they're, they're feeding to mostly young men, sometimes many of them teenagers, some young women, uh, most of them in the teenage years and 20s, uh, is this very positive message. Um, they particularly use this uh, fl uh, uh, um, flashy English uh, language magazine, Dubik, which is like the Al-Qaeda magazine inspired. Dubik named after a small town just across the, the uh, Turkish border in northern Syria that uh, is mentioned in some weak hadith as being the site of a great Armageddon confrontation, a thing they return to. So they say it's prophecy fulfilled, um, 
And uh, that particular um, hadith uh, mentions the Romans returning, they use the language of the Crusaders, and they say, well, the fact we've got this coalition uh, arrayed against us is proof that we're where God wants us to be and we're on God's side. Um, which, of course, is a silly claim, but for the young people consuming their material, they're not consuming anything else. Uh, I, I doubt that people who are reading Dubbing or, uh, or looking at the videos via Facebook or YouTube are reading the New York Times. Um, uh, they are living inside a bubble in a, in a loop where they're just consuming this story. And it's a convincing story. Um, they say that this is the fulfillment of prophecy. This Sham, Great Assyria, Sham, is, is the land of the great battle, the final battle. Imagine the attraction of the young minds to be part of history in this final confrontation of history. And yes, they face casualties, although for them it's martyrdom, so it's not, um, you know, it's kind of a win-win situation. But they say the Crusaders will eventually fail. They will fail. And of course, um, there's a sense that with, this is the continuation of the game plan that began with 9-11 provoking a response in Afghanistan, the unexpected uh, extra of a response in Iraq, which gave perfect storm conditions for insurgencies, which saw the precursor to this group arising. And all along the experience has been, um, as with Afghanistan throughout history, invading forces will eventually be fatigued. Doesn't matter how many resources they have, they'll run out of resources, they'll lose political will back at home, they'll have to retreat with the tail between their legs. So their confidence is not without some basis. You can sort of see their logic. And, and uh, uh, in any case, uh, they have this very powerful brand of a khilafah, or of a caliphate. Now you can debate historically, uh, theologically, their claim on this, um, and you can debate whether references to the Ottoman Empire as a, as a caliphate you know, really makes sense with it was like the earlier caliphates. But for the young minds consuming this material, it doesn't matter. They're not historians, they're not theologians. They're taking a very simple view. Uh, they by and large don't have a, a lot of knowledge, and the charismatic mentors don't have a lot of knowledge. So black and white certainties are powerful, and this is a very, very powerful brand to have declared a caliphate. And they did it June 29. They're, they're holding on to it. Um, of course, they speak of this as being a new era, a new era of dignity. And uh, Thomas Friedman was right on one occasion when he said years ago that um, poverty doesn't cause terrorism, but poverty and dignity contributes significantly. And this is a response to poverty of dignity. Um, it, it makes people feel good. This is the sign of being on the winning side. Um, going back to the sectarian issue, uh, they're making a big point about saying they're liberating the, the Sunni tribes. Um, the reality on the ground is, is very mixed, but um, this is their messaging. Uh, they now have a number of Iraqi security forces, uh, former generals, colonels, senior officers in their ranks. Uh, many of them actually um, were part of the prison breaks in, in July of last year that, that, that contributed hundreds and hundreds to their core strength. Al Qaeda fighters and others who have been radicalized in prison in the uh, eight prisons they, they um, organized jail breaks from around Baghdad. But uh, it, it is true, a lot of their military now comes from former Iraqi uh, security force uh, senior officers. Um, their argument is that the entire Muslim world is lost in ignorance, in darkness. Now, for the young minds, um, this is powerful. They're saying, don't listen to your local imam or sheikh or stuff. Uh, they don't really know what they're talking about. And mum and dad, they might mean well, but they're, they're ignorant. Um, we can show you the truth. And you have to come and join us to find the truth. The truth, unfortunately, is a very fundamentalist truth. So they might claim to be liberating Sunni tribes in the north. The reality is uh, they are at war with everyone. So they're at war with traditional um, uh, Syrian Muslims. They're at war with traditional uh, Iraqi Muslims. Uh, everything about traditional Islamic practice in the Middle East, the, sort of, the concept of, of ziyara, making pilgrimage, venerating places, finding spiritual energy, and, and historic journeys, all of that is an anathema to them. This is the, uh, Barney mentioned the, uh, or referred to the Protestant Reformation, and, and of course we think of the iconoclasts smashing up churches and cathedrals. This is, this but to the power of 10. Uh, this is iconoclasm with, with real explosives. And, and unfortunately, brutal effect on lives. Uh, it needs to be, uh, you know, remembered that most of the victims of al Qaeda style movements are, are, are Muslims. And they're mostly Sunni Muslims. They're not even mostly Shia Muslims. They're mostly Sunni Muslims who the group claims to protect. This is their formula to young minds. That you have to leave suburban Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane, leave behind mum and dad's house. Uh, the old pattern of jihadi groups was to say you can't be a true Muslim without, making, uh, without joining the jihad in one form or the other. 
Now they have a few more elements there. So you have to make hijra, this historic term referring to the prophet's migration, misused of course, but it, it's a very powerful motive. Um, you have to make hijra, you have to make, migrate, leave home. Uh, you have to join with the community, the Jama'ah. You have to fight against the Talmud, against the tyrants. Uh, you have to swear allegiance. You have to support the, the uh, Khalafa. Um, there's, there's, there's no sitting on the fence here. You're either with the Islamic State or the, the Caliphate or you're not. Um, and the message is wrapped up for young minds in a very evocative uh, message of um, redemption. So you make hijra and you find forgiveness. Uh, your life comes to order. So Muhammad Ali Barale was uh, partying hard, drugs, alcohol, uh, working in King's Cross. He has a religious experience, which is generally a very good thing. But he falls in with bad company, and then worse still, he becomes part of the bad company, influences dozens of young lives in Western Sydney through street dharma. But how can they appeal to young people in, in the streets of Australia? Well, this message, you can go from zero to hero. You can turn all your life around, all of your mistakes and failures, and you can find forgiveness. Just you know, take the ticket we're offering you, get on the flight to Istanbul, hop on the bus, join the brothers. Um, they present this as not just following in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad, but in the footsteps of Prophet Ibrahim. Um, but of course, you don't have to take the camel, you can, you can, camel, you can take, take the, the 767. Um, they've just had their, their fifth issue, this seems to be coming out once a month now, Dubbik magazine, and the theme is very uh, ominously, remaining and expanding. And, and there is real truth in this. It's, it's, it's spin, it's propaganda, but it has truth to it. Uh, they are going to be where they are, they are along the Euphrates and Tigris for some time to come. It's not going to be easy to dislodge them. Um, and they're picking up support beyond the region. So they present themselves as defenders of the Sunnis in Anbar. Um, they speak about unifying the ranks, but of course it's a very exclusivist, if you're not with us, you're against us, kind of unifying. Um, but in this issue, which came out last Friday, um, they say we're celebrating news from our brothers around the world who are joining with us. So prayer of things here. Oops. Um, they, um, you know, along the way, mention uh, Qabane or Ayn al-Islam, uh, as it's known in Arabic, and say that, you know, the coalition's been suckered into a failing mission. Uh, they're pouring resources in with their air missions, but it'll fail. Um, meanwhile, in Yemen, uh, the brothers are joining with us. Uh, and, and, and aligning themselves with our color fates. Uh, here we have, they say, um, Islamic State fighters in Sinai, which is, which is very worrying. Um, they speak of Sinai, of course, as, as a historic land where um, God revealed himself to Moses, so um, it's a very important part of their, uh, their vision. Libya, they're now saying that the brothers in Libya are aligning with Islamic State. And there is some truth in this. This is, this is not just a color fate or Islamic State in Iraq, Syria but potentially an archipelago of little mini caliphates who are uh, symbolically aligning themselves, which in areas where there are failing states is, is a significant threat. Uh, here, reference to um, the port city in Libya that is, is aligning itself with them. And uh, Algeria, you know, we've had this terrible um, kidnapping and execution in Algeria, and they're saying the brothers in Algeria were very wise. They're, they're getting on board with the mission. Um, so their theme is, uh, we're here to stay. Uh, yes, the Crusaders have turned up. Yes, we're fighting with them. Yes, many of our ranks are becoming martyrs. Um, but we're with God. God is with us, and we will prevail. And that's you know that's a that's a really horrible vision. Um, but as I said, the vision that we see from their messaging is um, a, a message of um, executions, which are meant to make us angry, uh, meant to provoke us into phoning up 2GB or 2UE and saying, what the hell are these people doing? Uh, which uh, degrades the quality of our community life and makes recruiting easier because when somebody says to their young friend, see they hate you, it's a much more convincing message when we speak hateful language. Uh, but as I said, the, the guys consuming this message are consuming it within a little closed loop, in a little bubble. And, and it's all about leaving the comforts of home, making hijra, joining with the Jama, uh, being with the brothers, being welcomed. You've seen the video of, of uh, Abdullah el -Nir. And the poor guy, Paul, is smiling from ear to ear because he's now with the big guys, hero. Well, his new friends gave him one way ticket. That's very, very tragic. But you can see the appeal of this idea. Suddenly you were nobody and now you're a hero. Uh, redemptive narrative. And um, it, it's this more than all the sectarian dimensions and, 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 and the, the 
complexities, geopolitics of the ground, which are making this, this movement possible. But it is those sectarian dimensions. It's the failure of the Maliki government. Uh, it's, it's what happened post-Arab Spring in Syria, the civil war, uh, that's opened up an opportunity for a movement that, that actually doesn't have an easy message to sell, um, that ordinarily faces very strong headwinds, but in the context of, of state failure, um, can make inroads on the ground there, but also, and the new element is, it, it, it's now a movement that's active around the world. And of course, the more recent um, challenge we're facing is that these foreign fighter networks around the world uh, may increasingly turn to projecting attacks around the world, not just sending their, their money and, their, and the young people. I'll leave it there.